there is no way anyone in New Zealand uh, cannot have watched the news, indeed in some places in the country, walked down the street or read a newspaper or listened uh, to, to the news on the radio, on the wireless, and not know that the uh, crime de jour at the moment is ram raiding. It is a form of crime where people or groups of people get cars and they drive them into shop frontages, therefore breaching the physical barrier of the shop and then jump out of the car, grab a whole lot of stuff, sometimes I think drive the car away, sometimes just run away. It is a particularly, it's not exactly, you know, high crime, crime of the century, let's get together and plan the ram raid. It seems a rather blunt and brutal uh, crime. It is a property crime largely, um, but for those who are victims, the shop owners, often not large corporates. It's not like you're breaking into a bank that spent a lot on security. Those who are victimised by ram raid crime tend to be small business owners, people who run dairies, people who run bottle shops or electrical stores, and it hits them hard. And, of course, they've got to pay their insurance, they've got to rebuild their shops. And ram raiding, ram raiding is on the rise, and it seems at present... The government can't do much uh, about it. We have been waiting for now about five weeks. Um, when we had Chris Hipkins on five weeks ago, he said he'd get back to us in a couple of weeks after he was appointed the Minister of Police. He does, he has promised actually next Wednesday, has it been? He says he'll be with us, Chris Hipkins, the Minister of Police. Um, but in the meantime, um, the National Party, of course, because law and order is a hot um, button topic for an election. Uh, they've been talking about, and there's been something of a war of words between Chris Hipkins and the National Party's police uh, spokesperson, uh, Mark Mitchell. Um, because Chris Hipkins can't be with us until next week, Mark Mitchell joins us uh, on the line now. Mark, welcome uh, back to the platform, my friend. Morning, Sean. Thanks for having me on. All right, just talking about the numbers here, there really is... A kind of this is the hot crime, isn't it? Ram raiding. Well, in, in terms of numbers, since 2018, ram raids have increased by over 500 um, percent. So yes, we're seeing them. We're seeing them daily. I mean, in the Waikato, there were four or five in the Waikato yesterday. There's another one in Auckland uh, overnight. And um, so yes, they are. And talking to your point, um, they're a quick and easy, much easier way for them to get access uh, to a shop you know, um, uh, steal what they want. And you're right, sometimes they leave in the vehicle if they can get the vehicle back out of the shop frontage or sometimes they just uh, decamp on foot. So I hate to say it, it's kind of a low-rent crime. You're not going in there wearing gloves and a cat burglar's outfit and using diamond cutters to get round an alarm system. It's wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, a ram raid, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty brutal and violent, but um, often they know what they're after uh, when they're going in. I had a, it wasn't a ram raid, but I had an aggravated robbery and one of the jewellers in my electorate last or two weeks ago, and um, it was very clear. It was two youth offenders, one with a, one with a hammer, one with an axe, uh, with two female um, shop attendants that managed to have presence of mind to be able to get themselves to the back of the shop. But um, they were targeted. They had already planned. They knew exactly where they were going. They knew exactly what they were after. And, and it, look, I think the big thing here, Sean, is that although a lot of these ram raids, yes, there's no um, shop owners or employees or customers' presence at the time, there is a huge human cost to this. And uh, on Sunday, we actually visited a super at Penrose, myself, Chris Lutzen, and Paul Goldsmith. And the young guy there is a young family, two young kids. He said that he's at a point now, he's been hit three times in the last three months. He said he's at a point now where he asked friends and family not to call him at night because when his phone goes, um, it just does a massive anxiety dump on him. Wow. He's wondering whether or not he's getting a call. Um, yeah. yeah, and he, wants, he actually wants to get out of the business. Um, he's had enough. Mm. Mark, look, the other thing, given that it is such a brutal, unnuanced crime or way of nicking stuff, yep. I guess anyone yep. can do it. You don't need to have been a long-term criminal or, you know, no, uh, right. or have a whole lot of expertise. You just need a car and some stupidity and and you're off. That's right. There's, um, there's certainly no sophistication around it. But um, And the other thing, Sean, the reason why they, they keep going is because you get especially these youth and juvenile offenders, are actually out on social media goading um, you know, other people to go out and, um, and try and commit a better 
um, uh, ram raids. So you know, it's just it's it's a it's a never ending cycle. And that is an aspect of this that I am interested in and only recently became aware of. Social media is being used to almost, I, I, I don't know, lionise the people who are committing these crimes. It seems crazy to me that criminals would do that because surely that gives police a very clear avenue of investigation. Yeah, it does. And they are, the police are actively monitoring those social pages and... Um, and without a doubt, they do take action. Look, the police are in a really frustrating situation. Because of the policy settings of the soft on crime government, they are completely, totally snowed under. They have to prioritise the jobs they can get to. They have got one hand tied behind their back because of the current um, policy settings in terms of their response uh, to these ram rates. And, and on top of that, uh, there's no real consequences. The uh, justice system and the youth justice system is not really backing them up or supporting them. Mm. What proportion, do we know what proportion of Ram Raiders are young or youth offenders under their majority, Look, under have, 18? No, we, we, don't have the, um, we don't have the proportions on that. However, it's safe to say that um, the good majority are youth and juvenile offenders. Okay, now you had a bit of a war of the words over the weekend with, with Chris Hipkins. You said you believe in some instances gangs were deliberately encouraging or using young members or juveniles to commit these crimes. Do you have any evidence of that? What did you base that on? So I base that on direct feedback from the frontline police officers that I've been going around the country talking to. I base that on my own experience. I had a policing career myself for 14 years and have been involved in, um, in public safety for most of my adult life. And, um, and the fact of the matter is the gangs are a huge influencer on juvenile and youth offenders. They have a big online presence where they try to, like you say, lionise and, and detract um, young people uh, and prospects uh, into the gangs. The gangs historically have always used young offenders to commit crimes because the, the risk is much lower in terms of the consequences and, um, and the action taken against um, youth offenders. So, you know, to, to, it's naive to say that gangs aren't a big part of, uh, of what's driving um, youth offending as well. They are, they, mm. without a doubt. They have a big influence on them. Mm. Look, I hear in the news today there is some sort of joint initiative to get together a fund to help shop owners and others basically make their premises safer against ram raids. People are talking, you know, bulletproof or hardened glass, putting bollards up in front of shops. I hate to say it, Mark Mitchell, but to me that's giving in. If you turn, if you turn your home into a fortress because it's being attacked, that is admitting defeat and drawing up, pulling up the drawbridge. Surely the idea is to catch these offenders and stop people doing it and stop people emulating them. Yep, you're absolutely right. And if you talk to shopkeepers and communities, they don't want to feel like they're, um, they're walking through the middle of Baghdad um, with, uh, with shops completely fortified. And, uh, but unfortunately, it's a response uh, that's obviously the government have made. By the way, it's, it's atrocious. They announced... Um, a $6 million package to allow businesses uh, to put bollards up and other security measures. The, the, the minister in the House yesterday couldn't even tell me how many security systems had actually been installed. Well, it's they ridiculous. $6 million, yeah. is that, uh, either you do it for everyone or you do it for no one because you know what's going to happen, Mark Mitchell. They'll do a couple, I don't know, a couple of Labor Party member dairy owners will get it, they'll get their picture in the paper and they'll say, oh, problem solved. Well, I think the other thing too, Sean, that, um, and I, I actually couldn't believe this in the House yesterday, you know, my team said, look, let's check and make sure the Minister's actually been and out and visited and spoken with the victims of these ram raids. He has not visited one business that has been the subject of a ram raid. He has got no feedback. He hasn't um, gone out to understand what, how they're feeling, what support they need, what they have, what response, what additional response they could have in government. Um, and I just find that completely, totally outrageous that uh, that you got the police. And, he's, and, and his answer to that was, it's not his job. Um, you know, it's atrocious. And uh, in, the, in the face of a tsunami of ram raids uh, every every day around the country. Yeah. Um, hey, what's the rate of return on a ram raid? I can always remember some years ago listening to a former Black Power, a mongrel mob guy saying. Oh, we're so dumb when you figure out the cost or the time that you do in prison for getting caught for a bank robbery and how much you get off the average bank yeah. robbery. It's just really bad economics. Is ram yeah, raiding that, that, any better what, or not? Not really. I mean, some of it is on order for high-value goods. Uh, most of it's for cigarettes. Um, 
you know, the, obviously the the jewellers they're, they're targeting uh, high value goods and the jewellers. Um, but they're, they're, but he's absolutely right. Predominantly, you're not going to see patched up gang members out um, committing ram raids. They're sort of behind the scenes. Um, in some cases, directing operations. Um, but they're more focused on the top end, the methamphetamine trade, um, you know, money laundering and um, you know car theft and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Now look, the other crime or if you like, crime trend that had everyone going a few weeks back, and I imagine is still happening, was basically into gang shootings, uh, right, um, particularly in Auckland. Has that dropped off a little bit? That, that has. So um, the, the, sp- the real spate of drive-by shootings that we saw, it now turns out related to the theft of a patch. Um, I think the Killabees had one of their patches taken by the tribesmen. That's what sort of sparked it. Um, which just highlights the fact of what, why we announced as one of our policy settings is to get banned patches and gang insignia because Auckland was under siege for a couple of weeks all, all because of a gang patch. Um, really? But, was know, that, so that was a fashion, you know, a fashion crime, a gang fashion yeah, crime was what was, that was about. It, it Jeez. Was. It was. Well, they, they put a lot of water in their gang patches. Um, you know, so, you know, we had, a, we had two weeks or three weeks of constant drive-by shooting where by some miracle a member of the public wasn't ser- seriously injured or killed. Um, all because of a gang patch. And that's exactly why we're saying we're going to get rid of the things um, if, we're, if we're back in government next year. All right, what would um, you do about the, the ram raids, though, Mark? So the ram raids, um, you've got to... Number one, you've got to start wrapping support around it. You've got to identify the youth and juvenile offenders that are involved in that. You've got to have a graduated um, response. So if you've got a seven-year-old child, which is in some cases they've had children as young as seven, obviously that means looking at their family getting the parents engaged, wrapping support around them, getting proper um, role models into their lives, right through to the serious, you know, recidivist violent offenders at 16 and 17 that need to be in a youth justice facility. Um, but, you know, there just there needs to be a positive response because a lot of these, if you talk to the police, they're dealing with youth offenders on a Friday night that are back out reoffending on Saturday night. Not only are, are they putting themselves in, in harm's way, but obviously they're putting the public and the police in harm's way as well. Mm. All right, and how long do you think, if you did that, would it take to stop the ram raid trend? Oh, look, I think you could make a meaningful um, impact on ram raids and youth crime by looking seriously at the powers the police have gone, enabling them, allowing them to get actually um, to get out and do their job, uh, ensuring that there is proper consequences and there is proper um, follow-up in terms of whether it be a family intervention or whether it be on the other end and someone getting a sentence to a um, youth justice facility or even transferring the case into, in, from youth court into um, district court. But um, I, I think that if you support the police and get behind them, if you free them up, if you allow them to get back to basics and, um, and the justice system supports them and gets behind them also, then we can make um, inroads pretty quickly in terms of this um, you know, tsunami of youth offending. All right. Um, I'd also add that the minister, I think, responded on the weekend saying all you've got is a couple of anecdotes He's going to base his policies on fact. What's your response to that? Well, it's true that I've got plenty of anecdotes because I'm doing public meetings um, that are standing room only, public safety meetings all around the country. I'm meeting with police. I've met with uh, the Gisborne police on uh, Friday. And so I'm getting plenty of direct feedback um, from the community. And I would encourage the minister to do exactly what he isn't doing. And that's actually get out and speak to people and speak to communities and find out what's happening out there rather than sitting back in uh, Wellington and the Ivory Tower and thinking that he's got all the answers there because he hasn't, obviously. All right. Well, we are going to have him on this uh, program next Wednesday. Uh, we have been promised to talk about these issues. Look, while I've got you there, and because you are the National Party's uh, police spokesperson, we've been covering a story about possible police involvement in an immigration matter being the refusal of entry to New Zealand of an Australian national. And it would seem, or an email has been published purporting to be from Interpol in Wellington looking for dirt on this individual because it's been decided they don't want him in the country. Firstly, are you aware of that story? I'm only vaguely aware of it, Sean. I, I did see, um, I did see a headline on that. I haven't got across okay. the issue. But, Do um, you think New I, Zealand I Police think. should be involved in leading or proactively seeking out to ban individuals from coming to New Zealand, or should that be totally a matter for immigration on principle? No, 
Look, I, I think that police have got... I don't know exactly how the um, that relationship interacts between police and immigration, but my view would be is that police would gather the information that they're privy to and that they're able to and legally to, and then they would pass that to immigration and immigration would make, um, would make decisions based on the information that they receive from other agencies. On the face of it, that's how I would see it working, but um, look... Don't, um, okay, just all right, I understand. I, I, I dump that on with that without talking to you. Mark, I thank you very yeah. much indeed uh, for your time, and I hope whether or not you're the minister, we can deal w- with the ram raiding trend, which does seem to me to be yep. a particularly low rent and, and destructive crime that is damaging a, a lot of lives. I thank you for your time this morning. That is Mark Mitchell. He's the National Party's uh, police spokesman. What, what do you think of what he had to say... Uh, and what do you think of ram raids? I don't know. There's something I do not like. Uh, no one likes any crime, I guess. Um, how often do you see a bank robbery these days? Hardly ever. Hardly ever. And whilst there is some, you know, the government says you can, we'll put up bollards, we'll put up mesh across our our dairy fronts so that they're not subject to ram raids, that seems to me to be a very negative policy response. It is basically saying, we can't beat you, we're just going to build a wall around ourselves. And that is not an open society. It's not the Kiwi way. Um, we've got to have better better policy responses than that, don't we? Um, your thoughts on that?